The marker is unclear and the mind would be equally chaotic. The marker doesn't indicate anything at all. It cannot fix a middle. If the mind were in the middle, it would be as unfixed as your marker. It would be chaotic. Ultimately, which place is the middle? There isn't any place that is the middle. So the middle you speak of is probably also a mistake. Sutra Ananda said, The middle I speak of is neither of those. As the world honored one has said, the eyes and forms are the conditions which create the eye consciousness. The eyes make discriminations. Forms have no perception, but a consciousness is created between them. That is where my mind is. Commentary Ananda said, The middle I speak of is neither of those. The mind isn't located inside or outside. This isn't what I meant. Won't honored one. As the won't honored one has said, the eyes and forms are the conditions which create the eye consciousness. It's just as you explained before, won't honored one. Ananda is still using statements the Buddha made in the past as evidence for his point of view. Won't honored one, you said that when the eye encounters forms, the eye consciousness is created between them. The eyes make discriminations. Why are the conditions for the arisal of the eye consciousness of seeing created when the eyes encounter form? Because the eyes make discriminations. Forms have no perception, but a consciousness is created between them. That is where my mind is. The defining object of form has no awareness of its own. But when the eyes encounter it, a kind of discriminating mind arises in their midst. And this is where my mind is. The middle I'm talking about is a place where the eyes and forms meet to create the eye consciousness. That is my mind. Sutra, the Buddha said, if your mind were between the eye and an object, does the mind substance combine with the two or does it not? Commentary, the Buddha listened to Ananda dispute his explanation and replied, If your mind were between the eye and an object, does the mind substance combine with the two or does it not? Suppose it is as you say and the mind is in the middle between the eye and the defining object of form. Do they combine? Are they one or are they two? So try, if it did combine with the two, then objects and the mind substance would form a chaotic mixture. Since objects have no perception, why the substance has perception, the two would stand in opposition, which is the middle. If it did not combine with the two, it would then be neither perceiver nor perceived and would have no substance or nature. Where would the characteristic of middle be? Commentary. If it did combine with the two, if your mind, the mind you say, is in the middle, includes the sense organs and their objects, then objects and the mind substance would form a chaotic mixture, which then is the substance of your mind, and which are the objects. Can you make a distinction? If you cannot, they are mixed chaotically together in a confusing disorder. Since objects have no perception, why the substance has perception? The two would stand in opposition. Things don't know anything. Why your eye organ has a mind substance? They are opposites. Which is the middle? Where is the middle you speak of? Is your mind in the middle of your eye? Or is it in the middle of the objects the eye sees? If it did not combine with the two, it would then be neither perceiver nor perceived and would have no substance or nature. If your mind does not combine with the eye and the object the, the eye sees, it will not be perceiving anything. It will have no nature that is aware. Where would the characteristic of middle be? In the final analysis, where is your mind? Sutra. Therefore, you should know that for the mind to be in the middle is impossible. Commentary. For these reasons, Ananda, you should understand that your argument that the mind is in the middle would stand. There is no such principle. 
Sutra. Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, when I have seen the Buddha turn the Dharma wheel in the past with the great Ma Udgalyayana, Saputi, Purna, and Shariputra, four of the great disciples, he often said that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations and is aware is located neither within nor outside nor in the middle. It is not located anywhere at all. That very non-attachment to anything is what is called the mind. Therefore, is my non-attachment my mind? Commentary. One suspects that Ananda began to get nervous after hearing the Buddha revealed yet another of his arguments. He had exhausted his knowledge and reached the end of his wit. By this time, there was no way out for him. There was no escape. So once again, he transferred some of the principles the Buddha had spoken previously to the present situation in an attempt to save himself from defeat. Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, when I have seen the Buddha turn the Dharma wheel in the past with great Maudga Lyayana, whose name means descendant of a family of bean gatherers, Saputi, whose name means born into emptiness, Purna, whose name means son of completion, completion and compassion, and Shariputra, four of the great disciples. They turn the Dharma wheel together. What does it mean to turn the Dharma wheel? It means to use the words spoken by the Buddha to teach and transform living beings. They are spoken this way and that way and all around, just as the principles of the Suragama Sutra as that now being explained over and over. That is why it is called a wheel. Turning the Dharma wheel reveals the principles and it crushes the heavenly demons and followers of other religions. When those of other religions encounter this wheel, they are smashed by it, obliterated. He often said, he repeated many times in the Agama Sutras and the Vaipulya Sutras that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations and is aware is located neither within nor outside nor in the middle. It is located anywhere at all. It is not located anywhere at all. If the nature of the mind which calculates, knows and makes distinctions is located neither inside nor outside, it should be located between them in the middle, but it isn't there either. It isn't anywhere. That very non-attachment to anything is what is called the mind. The aware perceptive mind is not attached to anywhere at all, and since it has no place of attachment, it is called the mind. Therefore, is my non-attachment my mind? Now I'm not attached. The mind I speak of is also not attached, but I don't know whether one can call it mind. Ananda thought that if he asked it this way, the Buddha would certainly agree that what he referred to was the mind. After all, the mind, the Buddha himself had said so, had said so. But what the Buddha had said previously was said in accordance with worldly dharmas. His explanation then was the guilt to the understanding of the people he was speaking to them. People of the small vehicle do not understand great vehicle drama, and if one would explain the true mind to them without any introduction, they would not believe it. So the Buddha spoke to them about the conscious mind. He was complying with worldly dramas. Now Ananda wishes to take the conscious mind of ordinary people as his mind. Is he right? Basically, Ananda's view would be acceptable from the point of view of ordinary people. But the mind the Buddha is speaking of is not the conscious mind. It is the permanently dwelling true mind, not the mind which has false thinking. Yet Ananda still thinks his false thinking mind is his true mind. He continues to mistake a thief for his son. Sutra, the Buddha said to Ananda, you say that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations 
and is aware is not located anywhere at all. The entirety of things existing in the world consists of space, the water, the land, the creatures that fly and walk, and all external objects. Does your non-attachment also exist? Commentary. The Buddha again replied to Ananda's explanation with a question. You say that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations and is aware is not located anywhere at all. To have no attachment is to have no location. The entirety of things existing in the world consists of space, the waters, the land, the creatures that fly and walk, and all external objects. There are two kinds of worlds, the sentient world, composed of living beings, and the material world, which includes all the mountains, rivers, the great expanse of earth, and all the various buildings. These an empty space and the myriad external objects together make up the two kinds of retributions, dependent retribution, which includes the land, the waters, the buildings, and proper retribution, which refers to our bodies. The world consists of these two. Does your non-attachment also exist? Among all these things in the world, where are you? What place are you not attached to? Is there some, some place where there is non-attachment or is there not? If your non-attachment is nowhere, then that's the same as saying it doesn't exist. Sutra, if it does not exist, it is the same as has on a tortoise or horns on a rabbit. How can you speak of non-attachment? Commentary, if it does not exist, it is the same as has on a tortoise or horns on a rabbit. Have you ever seen a turtle with hair or a horned rabbit? In other words, there is no such thing. How can you speak of non-attachment? If it doesn't exist, what is it you are attached to? Why did you bring up the word, the word non-attachment? Sutra, if non-attachment existed, it could not be said to be non-existent. To be non-existent is to be without attributes. To be existent is to have attributes. Whatever has attributes has a location. How then can it be said to be unattached? Commentary, if non-attachment existed, it could not be said to be non-existent. Drew proposed that at a certain place, there is a certain non-attachment, but you cannot say there isn't anything there. You speak of non-attachment, but if there is a certain thing called non-attachment, then you still have something, and how can you call that non-attachment? But if in fact it doesn't exist, if there is nothing there, why do you want to assign the name non-attachment to it? That is really a case of putting a hat on top of a hat or riding a donkey in search of a donkey. To be non-existent is to be without attributes. If you haven't any attachment, that is non-existence. To be existent is to have attributes. Whatever has attributes has a location. How can, how then can it be said to be unattached? But if it is not non-existent, then it has characteristics, and if something has form and an appearance, it thereby must have a location. If it has a location, how can you say it is unattached? Sutra, therefore you should know to call the aware, knowing mind, non-attachment to anything is impossible. Commentary, Anda's seventh attempt to locate his mind has failed as well. The Buddha says, therefore you should know, Ananda, to call the aware, knowing mind, non-attachment to anything is impossible. To say that your mind is non-attachment won't work either. Your argument won't stand. It is unreasonable.